All right. Um, should I get started? Yep. All right. Uh, so welcome everybody to my uh, talk. The name of my talk is DIY Biohacker, a genetic engineering RPG for online education. Um, and so I go by Zelda. If you call me Zelda, that would be great. If you accidentally call me Paul, I won't hold it against you, so don't worry about that. But yeah, I prefer to go by Zelda. Um, so yeah, where can we get started? So I teach a genetic engineering uh, lab course for the Stanford Bioengineering uh, major. And so it's it's a quite a nice little course that we teach in a, a lab. I'll show you, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And then we had to adapt this course for online education. So I'm gonna very briefly introduce the course to you, very shortly uh, tell you how we adapted it for online education. And then in the process, I think I came up with a better way to teach this course um, instead of online. So instead of you know doing it the way we have, in the past, I think we can do it by actually um, having like a role playing game, like an online gaming platform where we can students can log in, um, you know, and sort of learn about synthetic biology and genetic engineering. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and just keep going from here. Uh, just interrupt me with questions. I'm pretty bad with managing chat and presenting. So my apologies for that. But uh, Laura, no, you should just, just interrupt me or anybody just interrupt me if you need to. Totally fine. Will do. OK, so what is BIE44? Most of you probably know this already, uh, or many of you know this already. It's a genetic engineering lab course. And so for the first four weeks of the course, we teach students how to do lab work. I showed students how to take DNA out of cells and then how to put DNA back into cells. We do PCR, we show students how to work with bacteria, yeast and mammalian cells. Um, and in the first four weeks of the course, I would say it's pretty intense for students. There's a, quite a lot going on. Uh, some of you are nodding because you've, oh, I see Lauren is nodding because she took the course, um, you know, and she had this experience. And then from week four to week five, we uh, students design a genetic circuit. And so this is a plasmid, which is a circular piece of double-stranded DNA. And students design essentially their own plasmid. And so this genetic circuit has a promoter and it can make some kind of a, some kind of a gene. And so students can essentially design whatever they want. And so after the, the design part, I do the cloning, hopefully it works. And then if cloning goes fine, then from week six to week 10, students test their genetic device, their, their DNA device. And they, um, you know, they do many tests to verify that their DNA device worked correctly. Okay, and this is just an example of uh, E. coli bacteria with its normal genome, its own DNA, and this piece of DNA that we insert into the bacteria and make it sort of you know, manipulated to express whatever gene we want to. Okay, and this is normally, this is the space that we normally use to teach this, this lab course, which is an amazing space, very well equipped. You know, it's set up for an open lab environment where we share, uh, so there are centrifuges and thermocyclers and everything you can think of that we need to teach the course. Next door, we have a cell culture facility. So very well equipped for tissue culture um, and just an amazing little course. Okay, so with the pandemic, we had to figure out how to teach this course that I just explained to you online, okay? And so let me just read this top sentence because it sounds a bit nutty. Uh, BioE44 is a genetic engineering lab course that we had to teach online. That just doesn't sound right, does it? Um, and so how on earth was I supposed to do this? So the first thing I did is I went to the folks in biology. I thought maybe they figured it out because um, they teach a, a similar course called, called Bio45, a lab course. So I reached out to the folks in biology and I say, hey, what are you doing for online education? And the response was really sad. It turns out that none of us knew how to proceed with online education. And at this, at this stage, I, I realized I just need to like figure this out, right? So I worked with Stanley Chi and Bo Wang and uh, amazing TA Chu, Chu Chai, who's from Bo's lab. And through last spring and through the summer, we figured out how to, you know, sort of teach this course online. Um, Chu went ahead and just sort of researched any kind of lab kit you can find and genetic engineering lab kit you can find online. And this is what she came up with. 
Um, and so I just want to be clear that I have no affiliation with this company. Um, uh, but, uh, and I know that they did a presentation maybe for you guys earlier on. But this is the kit that we found that we just thought was absolutely the best, the best kit that we could find. It comes with this great little book. Um, I knew about the book, but I didn't know about the kit until Chu told me about, um, about the kit. So um, I reached out to this person, Julie Legault, who's really, really amazing. She, she helped me through this whole process of like figuring out, you know, how the kits work and um, how we can ship kits to students. And um, yeah, she's been a absolute rock star in helping me figure out how to, how to do all this stuff. So every student who signed up for BIE 44 received a, a kit like this, and it contains like, you know, these different components and sort of an incubation box where you can do your experiments in and then this textbook. And actually there's, a, there's an updated version of this text, which is really, really amazing. Um, so yeah, the kits were approved by Stanford Environmental Health and Safety as safe to use at home because they're by safety level one. And yeah, so that was quite a process. Um, and we had to ad adapt our course to be an, ex you know, to have this accessible biology theme because we're not in a lab anymore. We're students are at home and all, all over the world. And we're, we're trying to do genetic engineering online from, from different parts of the world. So what is accessible biology? So accessible biology is the pursuit of biology outside of scientific institutions by amateur students and hobbyists. And terms associated with accessible biology are things like do-it-yourself biology or biohacking, meaning you find some kind of a hack to do biology that doesn't require expensive lab equipment. Um, and I like this term citizen science. Citizen meaning this like decentralized thing. So, you know, uh, it's sort of accessible to everybody. All right, I'm gonna show you some pictures and some examples of what students did in the course. Um, I do have student names associated with each, you know, picture I'm showing you because I want to give them credit for the work that they did. I reached out to these students in December to ask if I can use these pictures. And so I'm only showing you pictures and images from students who took the course in the fall. I'm not showing you any images of students who did any um, work in the, in the winter just because I already had permission from these students to share these pictures. But please keep their names just, you know, in this meeting and confidential. Um, yeah. Um, so, so what students had to do, they had to set up a, a lab in their house. And these are just a few examples. The student, you know, had this table next to his couch because it was safe to do that. You can see he's got like wipes and his incubation box everything nicely labeled and set out to do his experiments. This student here had like a, like a picnic table or something that she put up in her, in her garage, perfectly fine, worked just as good. Um, and so, you know, so lab setup sort of varied a little bit depending, you know, on, on, you know, on, on where students lived and what resources they had available to them. This student went a little bit overboard, but I really like it. She, she taped this, this door, you know, over this thing, it's like a zip door. And it's got this this tag. It's you know biohazard tag. It's not really necessary because it's all safe. And then inside, you can see that she set it up. It looks like it's like next to her old like coffee maker or something. I don't know, but it doesn't matter because it's all safe. But I really liked this initiative. It was really really cool that they did that. All right. So part of what they did for this for their for their experiment, they had to do this like bio art thing. It's also called the canvas kit. So students did some bio art. These bacteria are expressing different color pigments. Um, and yeah, so this, this is just like a rabbit with fangs that one of the students did. And then some, some like a uh, reference to Beethoven that I, I'm not smart enough. I don't, I don't quite get it, but this is some like reference to Beethoven. And then this one is like a silly smiling dog, which I thought was quite cool. All right. So yes, this is just fun. You do some kind of bio art, but also students show us that they can grow bacteria at, at home and that they can do it safely. And they also show us that they actually understand antibiotic selection, which I think is quite amazing. Okay, here are just a couple of mo couple more examples. This is a tennis racket. Uh, if you're hungry, it might look like a drumstick. This is like a snail, a flower, you know, another smiley face, just a few examples. Um, all right, so this, this was actually quite cool to me. This student did her art by herself and then her mom saw what she was doing, okay? And her mom was like, 
what are you doing here setting up a lab and everything? And her mom just got excited about it and interested about it. And so her mom joined in and did her own artwork. So she made this flower. And so this is one of those unintended consequences of teaching the course online. Our students now actually became teachers and they, they you know, like this student taught her mom how to do genetic engineering, you know, enge you know, engineering at home and how to do this by art. And that's something I really, really liked. I thought that was quite an amazing sort of extra thing that I didn't think about. Uh, another part of this kit, uh, students had to do some actual genetic engineering. So this in the background, it's just a hand with a glove, a nitrile glove in, in blue here. And then there's a plate on this person's hand. And you can see that there's this stuff growing on the plate. This is bacteria, competent cells. And then they added a genetic circuit, a plasmid, that will express a pigment. So they they make they made this bacteria um, express this color. Okay, so no color, and then because they successfully added their um, their plasmid, they engineered this bacteria to now express this color pigment, and that worked, I'd say, fairly well. And then students could extract like uh, DNA from the strawberry if they wanted to. Um, yeah. Okay, so we run into a few difficulties and we're getting to the more fun part of the presentation in a bit here, but we run into a couple of difficulties. Uh, for example, international shipping we had students located all over the world. And then sometimes it would just take long for a kid to get to a student's house, right? And so they had to wait sometimes two weeks before they could even start with their experiments. Something that I didn't really appreciate until this process was uh, genetic engineering laws. Apparently, it is illegal to modify genetic content at your home in some countries. And so we had to learn laws from different countries and what was allowed. And again, this is where uh, Julie uh, from Amino Bio was an, an amazing, amazing resource because she has some experience with this and she knew sort of how to, how to navigate this stuff. Um, and then some other things, uh, a lot of our students after they had to leave campus actually moved in into like Airbnbs. I don't know if you're aware of that, but there were some complications where you were not able to, um, where USPS will not ship to an Airbnb, which is like, never thought about that. And so we had to work around that, but it all worked out fine. Okay, I was talking really fast. Let me just have a look at the time because that was like really fast. All right, so let's move to a different part of the presentation. Um, so now that I've taught the course in a lab and I've taught it online a couple of times, I think there's a better way to do it. I think uh, another way to teach a, this course or a course would be by using a um, online gaming platform. I think there's a lot that we can learn from the gaming community, especially now that everybody's on, you know, online and remote. Okay, why? Because the gaming community figured out how to sort of establish community and how to communicate and sort of interact um, on like online platforms. And they do that very, very well. I'm, I play, I play, I'm a gamer and that's why, that's why I know this, right? Um, so I know this is supposed to be the idea-a-thon, but um, let's do a, take a moment and have a imagine-a-thon, if that's even a real thing. So I'm just gonna imagine um, how I think we can make a game to teach synthetic biology and how I think it can be a, su a success. And then after I've imagined this with you, then maybe you can contribute and help me think of ways to you know, make, make it better or things that you would like to see in a format like this. Um, yeah, so imagine sort of a dystopian world where there are limited resources. Maybe there was some viral outbreak in you know, there are only a few survivors, okay? Um, the world, important, very important to note here, the world must be governed by natural laws, right? It's not magic, it should be governed by natural law. And so in this example, and, and I'm giving credit to this artist who designed this for some game, and this example is sort of an arid dry, dry environment. So maybe a real world climate change type, type environment with limited resources. And, and here is another example. So, so, you know, there's maybe a lot more growth here, but there's some like community where people can, um, can grow things and, and sort, of, sort of like a community that just lives in the space, right? 
Um, yeah, and there was this really bad movie in from the 90s called Biodome. And um, I sort of stole that name. I thought it would be cool if the world's name was Biodome. But yeah, the, the movie wasn't very great. All right, so, so the next part of this would be um, that each student who enrolled for the class would be a character. And so you can pick your own character, whatever that is. You can make your character. Uh, each character will start out with zero X, um, XP, so you don't have any experience. And as the character moves through the world and grows, it grows in experience points. So maybe you can think of that as a student who sits in class. They don't know much about a lecture, so you know, about the... Um, about the topic, but they grow as they learn uh, certain concepts. And by the end of the course, they have a lot, much higher XP, right? Um, it will be really cool, I think, if you can communicate by proximity. So what if you're a character and there's another character and when you, you can walk around in the world and then when you're next to each other, maybe you can, there can be like a, bu a bubble that pops up and you can just talk to one another. You can type or, or however you wanna do it. Um, and then another added thing, you know, these are just some characters I got online and I'm giving credit to this person who I think did the art. But what I like about making a character is that if I don't know the student, like they can be any character, like you can be purple, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, like you can be anything you want. And I think it, it, it gets rid of sort of like some like maybe gender bias or something like that. I don't know. Um, but, but yeah, you can be anybody in this world, right? Um, and then once you have your character, you can select your lab, right? So each student will have their own lab. Maybe you can build your lab in a barn or, or maybe you can build your lab in like, you know, like a mobile home or something. I stole this from uh, another, you know, I call it breaking good because I don't want to give that TV series too much, too much credit, but you know, maybe it could be something like this. Or maybe it can be a bunch of temporary housing things stacked together, like like um, like you know from, from from this example. But each each student will have their own lab, and the lab itself can also sort of grow in experience, if that makes sense. So the character can grow in XP, and the lab can grow in its, in its capacity to do more biology, and the biology that the lab can produce will be based on real life laws and um, you know time constraints sort of like a real biology lab experience all right so how do you sort of navigate lear learning in this environment and so a, a normal stanford course is about 10 weeks long and so it will be really cool if they can be like time specific events that are released into the world so one week you log on and it's like, you see that, oh, you know, something happened in the world and it guides you through a learning experience. Um, and so it could either be like, you know, like a mission that you can complete or some, you know, something that sort of guide, guided learning. Um, and the example I'm using here is, and those of you who take one or three, I'm just using Robert Remark, Robert Remark because he's quite remarkable my favorite character. But what if this guy shows up, right? He looks like a hipster. He's in the world suddenly. And, and you know, everybody in the world, you know, the class maybe has 30 students. Here's a new character. And when you interact with the character, he talks, talks to you and he says that cells come from other cells. And this is actually a historic figure who found this out. And then maybe there can just be like a learning object. Well, how is that possible? Um, and then we can learn about central dogma of molecular biology, and we can actually learn about DNA duplication. We can learn about transcription, translation, etc. So maybe there can be like many of these time-specific events that can be released into the world over time. Um, overall, putting everything together, I think it will be really amazing if the world sort of looked like something like this. So this is um, Stardew Valley. I don't own the copyright of this. I'm just showing this to you as an example. Um, but Stardew Valley, I think is a great engine. And I think it, the game works very, very well um, as an RPG. So here's a character, you know, so, so this could maybe be his lab, right? And then another student can have another lab here. And then again, you have an environment that could be sort of wild, but then you can also maybe cultivate things. So you can do things in your lab and you can do things sort of maybe with crops or something. And the, the, the idea here is that you use synthetic biology, you use genetic engineering to survive, to create a better future for this community. Um, 
to um, yeah to make medicine. Maybe the community needs medicine. Uh, another thing is maybe we can engineer plants. So maybe we can increase crop crop production, for example. We can also use genetic engineering to engineer trees to provide better building material. Uh, you know, and so yeah, so 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 we can maybe grow genetically modified plants in this world, or you can you know, you can make medicine in your lab and then isolate some kind of compound that can help another community member that is sick, something like this. And then of course, food production will be qu quite an uh, interesting topic. Um, and yeah, so so I like sort of the look of Stardew Valley. I like that it's sort of, sort of the graphics are very simple, but I, I, I don't know, I, I just like it for some reason, I don't know. And so that's sort of what I'm envisioning for what I would like for it to be and i think the possibilities here can be sort of sort of endless like i think there's so much that could be done you know in in an online platform like this as a game okay um yeah so again so maybe week one just to give you some idea of what this could be like week one you just sort of choose your character you set up your lab within this this world and then you meet other characters. So you meet students and instructors. Maybe we all log in every Monday and Wednesday and Friday at a specific time, something like this. Um, and then, you know, characters are there and you can set up your lab or something like this. Uh, and you can start learning the limitations of the world, you know, this virtual world. Um, you know, of course I said no magic. So it's not like, it's not like, um, I don't know. It's not, it's not like, of course, you know, so, so gravity applies and time and all this stuff, which I think will be great. Um, and then you can learn about the resources that are available and maybe there are limited resources at first, but then as your lab grows and as your character grows and experience, you can do more biology in this world and actually uh, produce more things as you, as you continue with it. And then, you know, biology really provides endless resources. If you think about it, like there's, there's so much we can do. I, I mean, uh, I think in my ignorance, I've always thought that, well, you know, I've known, I know a lot about biology and what else really is there to add. But then you, as you sort of learn, learn about biology, you actually learn more and more and learn that the possibilities sort of increase. It has this like exponential add, additive effect, I think. And, and I think that there's just so much that we still need to learn about biology. And, and really, I don't know how to incorporate that into this world. But, you know, that's something you can talk about. All right. Um, yeah, and then maybe week two, you know, there can be some time specific event, for example, where you learn about maybe somebody, maybe one of your characters finds a cave and in this cave, there's a, there's some like artifact, which is like um, an archive of all of the literature that you can find from the NIH, uh, you know, PubMed. So maybe we can teach students about PubMed and how to look for scientific literature um, and, you know, so, so that could be a learning objective and maybe introduce students to different online resources for, um, you know, I don't know, uh, protocols and experiments that they can do. All right, I'm going to sort of stop there now and I would like to sort of make it a bit more interactive and then to sort of see what feedback you might have, what thoughts you might have and ideas you might have. Um, what would you like to see in an R RPG uh, lab course? Is this even of interest to you? And then maybe we can just talk about it. I will say that I am probably going to write a little article about it. I, I should be very careful when I do this. I always tell people that I'm writing a paper and I'm like, hey, we should collaborate. But if any of you have really good ideas or if you're really excited, especially about gaming and you want to help just write something about it, then we should... Uh, we can, um, you know, you can, we can collaborate. I'm, I won't do this, I won't work on it until the summer just because I am too busy uh, right at this moment. But um, yeah, that can happen. So I think I've talked a lot. Uh, Lauren, how should we proceed with this? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to open it up for questions. As we know, Zelda here is the fabulous teacher of one of my favorite courses at Stanford, which was BioE44. Um, which is kind of like a 10 week long biohackathon or idea fund. So if you have any questions about what it's like to kind of like come up with a project, especially virtually in the field of like BioE, Zelda is a wonderful resource for that. Awesome. So who's got feedback or comments? Who wants to say something?
besides Lauren, who loves my course. I mean, all I, all I, all I have to say is I want to play your, your like online bio e D and D campaign as soon as possible. <laughs> I want to take that class. And, you know, if you think about like canvas and I don't know, like we're still using canvas, like think about it. It's like 2021. I used canvas when I was in like an undergrad, which was a very long time ago. And, and, you know, is, shouldn't there be like a better way to do this, you know, to, to administer courses and to communicate, to connect with people online. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's not a huge group. I mean, if anybody has any comments or if, you know, maybe not, but yeah. Oh yeah, that's right, Vershaw will show up. I'm just reading the comments in chat. Yeah, you know, Vershaw totally like stole his idea. I, I, I read about it again earlier this morning just to get my facts right. But Vershaw totally like stole uh, Robert Remarque's like idea from Sal's and he pl essentially plagiarized, yeah. It looks like Chris asked a question in chat. Is there a time in your mind that you think this platform will be available? I'm assuming like the, the gaming one. Yeah, so right now it's a concept, right? And I actually proposed it to folks in our department um, to see if we can just get it going. Um, and so right now there's no timeline. Um, at the very moment, I just want to sort of write about it and maybe just get my idea out there so nobody else steals my idea if you sort of if you sort of understand what i mean so i just want to write a small article about it just to as a concept but then um when it will actually happen i don't know i don't know it depends on how excited i can get other people to get involved i um i like to game like i play rocket league right but uh i don't really I'm not great at coding. So if I can find somebody who's really excited about actually coding and especially somebody who's good at like designing games, like, and, and just be like, Hey, let's, it doesn't have to be perfect. Right. Um, then maybe, maybe we can, we could do that, you know, and, and it, it really depends on sort of who you work with. Um, I was actually thinking of reaching out to the guy who started Stardew Valley. Uh, I've, I have a very good friend who works at Microsoft. He's the marketing director for Xbox live. And I'm thinking of collaborating with Microsoft because they have a lot of user data for Xbox login and stuff like this since the pandemic, which has spiked. So I can collaborate with them. I've got a really good connection there. Uh, ideally, I can work with somebody, you know, like the guy who's, who wrote Stardew Valley, but I don't know if they'd actually be interested. Um, but yeah, it sort of depends on who I can work with and time because you know, because I apparently I'm busy teaching other courses as well. So we have another great question in chat. Do you think there are some things that can't be completely transferred over this online RPG? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, so biology is unpredictable, right? Um, and 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 actually, I, I bet you if Drew Andy was here, he might have disagreed with the statement. Okay. Um, I think of biology as a little bit unpredictable. Now, when we do a lot of biology and we, we repeat things a lot, we know, we know certain things just work. And we know that there are certain parts um, that someone like Drew would call standard parts and re 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 reusable parts that we can just plug in. Um, this is true for things like promoters and proteins and things like this. Um, all the techniques that I cover in my course, those things are like, set in stone, you know, how to sort of, you know, you know, how to transform bacteria, grow them on plates on the correct antibiotic selection, you need antibiotics, um, you know, resisting genes and all this stuff. So a lot of that is just sort of, um, it's just sort of like standard things that we can definitely incorporate into this world. And also we know how long it takes to grow bacteria um, one thing I left that I didn't talk about is we should have like a plasma designer in this game. So you can you can design like a plasmid and pick like promoters and things like that. Um, so so for most part, I think the basic techniques will be sort of like fairly easy to reproduce in a game like this, growing things and maybe isolating proteins, you know. Uh, but then 
when it comes to more complicated biology, sometimes you get unexpected things that happen and sometimes really exciting things. Um, yeah, so in a systems biology approach, we call those, it could be, the, it's, it's sort of like a, like a emergent property, that's what it's called, uh, which means it's a new property that we couldn't predict by only looking at the parts. Um, and so some things have um, sort of like a, a synergistic effect, if that sort of makes sense in biology and unpredictable, um, unpredictable things do happen and are discovered in biology that we probably won't be able to incorporate in this game. Uh, but yeah, so, but, but I think a lot of the basic learning that students achieve in our course can be done in a game like this, yeah. So then what do you think about um, kind of one of those, the, the models of cells kind of like E. coli, like Marcus's lab has kind of been working on. Do you think that that's something that eventually might be integrated into a game like this, like model organisms? Yeah, yeah, so um, yeah, so that's a good idea. So uh, while I'm answering this question, I'm looking up, I'm gonna find a, a book for, for Ellen who was asking for a book recommendation. Um, yeah, so we can use different model, uh, model organisms. We can use different bacteria type, you know, different types of bacteria. I think we should definitely use like the standard bacteria. So I'm not too familiar with Marcus's course. I know he uses a systems biology approach in a lot of his work. Does he, does he work with like different communities of cells and look at the interaction? So I know that one of the things that he's been trying to do is like literally make just single cell, like a, an online simulation of a functional E. coli. I see, I see. Awesome, I didn't know that. So guess what? I'm gonna now contact Marcus. Thank you for that idea. <laughs> At least I'm, I'm like 95% sure it's his lab. Sure, well, that's okay. That, that's how I feel about a lot of people, a lot of my coworkers, because a lot of their work is so, so complex, so. Um, I'm quickly gonna look for a book um, to post in chat to, to, there we go. There we go. Um, other questions from anybody? No, or ideas? I, would, I have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. I would love, I would love to hear, I think that this platform of coming up with like some game that students would be able to play and learn about biology is, a really amazing like idea for enhancing like openness and science communication and things like that. And I'm wondering like how you, I know that you said you're a gamer, I know that you love Rocket League. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you come up with like an idea like that? How, where did it start? Um, I don't really know, to be honest with you. Um, well, well, no, the, the, the where I came up with the idea was um, last year in um, like around this time, you know, COVID-19 and we were like, you have to teach this course online. And it just made me think, well, um, how, how would I like to sort of, how would I like for this course to be taught online if I have like endless resources, you know, and sort of put myself in the shoes of other students and thinking, um, you know, do, you, do I really want to go through entire course just through like Zoom lectures and Canvas, you know, I do that for all my courses, right? But I think it gets like, I think it just gets like old after a time, after some time. And I think that as educators, we don't really, we are not experts, uh, you know, on like how to interact online. And most definitely the gaming community knows how to do that. And, and for me, it was a no brainer. It's like, you know, cause, cause I, I connect same contact with my friends who live all over the world, just by, you know, I would just like jump in a game with them and we chat. And that's my sense of community. You know, that's great. It works great for me. My, like I said, my best friend uh, lives in Seattle, works for Microsoft, and we just like we can just jump into a game, and just chat and enjoy playing a game. And for me, that works very well as a online community. Um, you know, I, I, for me, that works great. And I was like, well, how do we do this for students? Like, how do you teach a how do you create a sense of community? Because you know, when you're when you're on campus, you walk to class and you have your friend next to you or a stranger next to you, and you might start talking, and maybe I put you in a group, you know, and you you call your group like the lab notes or something like that, um, and you meet other people in your group, right? Or or maybe you 
you know, you sit next to a student and you ask them for help on something. And then, you know, you, the lecture ends and maybe you go get a lunch together. You know, you know, like you have that community when you're on campus. And that is what we're missing with online education. And, and how do we make up for that? Now it's like Zoom lectures where we just talk to you, right? And you're sitting there absorbing the information. And then before you can even have an opportunity to say anything, it's like, okay, the session is done, cancel the meeting and we're out of there, right? Uh, sometimes we make Zoom breakout groups. I mean, educators are running out of ideas. <laughs> like we got to find like ways for you to interact with one another. Um, for BIA 44, I did do this thing called community groups on Fridays where really the intent was for students to only interact with other students. And I don't even know if that worked as great as I wanted it to work, but the intention was to create community, you know, because I knew that was definitely going to lack with online education. So, yeah. Good questions. I did post a link for this book, Genetic to uh, uh, Zero to Genetic Engineering Hero in chat, which is a really nice textbook. Uh, credit to Julie again, who did the artwork in that book. She's amazing. So, yeah, I also threw in the chat a link to an article about Marcus building the, the computer cell. Ah, cool. Let me check that out. Oh, there we go. Huh. Cool. All Thank right, if so there, much. does anybody want to ask? Oh, go ahead, Sophia, ask a question, go ahead. Oh, oh I was gonna say thank you so much for your time. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thanks for, thanks for logging in. So I, it was good to be here. Uh, if you're not a bioengineering major, then you should probably change your major. I'm just gonna say it to everybody because it's quite an awesome major. Uh, it's a bit challenging, but you know what? We help students and the learning is quite amazing. Um, I did my postdoc in pathology. I taught a Thinking Matters course as a Thinking Matters fellow. I told I was part of the cancer problem. This was like five years ago or something like that. Um, and I was a bit of a biology snob. I was all about genetics and biology and I knew nothing about bioengineering. And then I got a job in bioengineering. I was like, I don't know any of these people, um, but I, I don't know, I, I think that we select students who are willing to be challenged a little bit, but we also find students who are creative. Like they're like, we wanna make, like they're more like project orientated, you know? So they're more like, we wanna, like our capstone course is all about designing some some like medical device, right? And by 44 the lab course I teach, like you design your own genetic device. Um, and I think that is really cool for, in terms of bioengineering, I think we do that well. Um, and I think we do a decent job actually equipping you to feel like you can do those things. So that you start out and you're like, I don't know how to code. I don't know how to biology. I don't know how to do nothing. And then I feel like we do, we spend a lot of time actually training people to do those things. You know, we don't just expect you to be an expert. We, 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 we try to train people. And I think bioengineering is quite an amazing major. I'm just going to leave it at that. I've been converted. I've changed my mind quite a lot about bioengineering. It's a good place to be. So I didn't. Uh, I, I wanted to study biology, and then when I got into Stanford, I was like, well, I can't go to Stanford and not get an engineering degree. So bioengineering, but it's it's not my passion too. I agree. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I, I also. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, it was funny that you brought that up because I am a freshman um, and I am like, after attending this like idea-thon, I'm really good like, questioning my major. I mean, so I'm, I'm like thinking of doing human biology. Like I've been thinking yeah. that this whole year, I'm pre-med. Okay. And uh, I joined this idea-thon and I was like, why not give it a try? I kind of feel like I, I'm a creative person. Like I was in robotics in high school um, and like now doing this and like hearing all the cool opportunities there are like, I'm kind of like tempted to change to bioengineering. However, I'm kind of tempted by the major require. I mean, not tempted. I'm kind of like scared off by the major requirements yeah, because there's so many like, engineering courses and I I just like I don't really have an, a lot of experience in the field you know yeah so, how much math have you done 
Or you should talk to Lauren and help her out. Yeah, let me let me just say I when I was in high school, I hated math. It was my least favorite subject. And then they said at college you can take whatever classes you want. And I was like, great, I'm never taking another math class again, and I'm never taking another history class. <laughs> and then I said, and then I ended up doing bioengineering. I was like, man, I gotta take all these math classes. Um, but I actually I think that the math classes so far that I've taken at Stanford, like they were nothing like high school. I learned a lot. I think that the bioengineering classes, like I, I heard rumors that 103, which is what I'm currently taking with Zelda now, is like uh, it was very difficult, but so far I'm absolutely loving it. It's it's exactly what I'd imagine like a pre-med education should be like. We look at case studies, we look at like diagnosing patients and symptoms and how we like run those tests. And it's it's absolutely fascinating. And so I think that even the classes that look hard on paper um are actually like i've i've just i've learned so much from them and i've like genuinely enjoyed taking them in ways that i i never expected so i i i, I have a lot of pre-med friends in the bio e department and and they absolutely love it i don't think i've met someone studying bioengineering that regrets it yeah and, and i will say this that in human bio i I gather that the major is sort of large, like a lot of students, they have a lot of human bio students. The bioengineering community is sort of small for the exact same reasons that you just mentioned. You know, people are scared of like the math requirements and all this stuff. Um, but we have like maybe like 30 students a year only that, that graduate from our program. And, you know, I'm part of the, I'm one of the people who write recommendation letters for our students. Like I get to know our students uh, you know, that teach multiple courses. I write recommendation letters for them. Um, and our students get into amazing, amazing programs. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, so I would say bioengineering has a reputation for being like a really cool major amongst other institutions as well, if that sort of makes sense. And if you are considering medical school, then maybe you'll think about that. Um, and grades are not like everything. Like students hate it when I say that. But, but you know, if you're just curious to learn like, genetic engineering and I don't know what whatever then 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 there's just I don't know that you know like the grade is not everything and I, and I yeah I, I know it's 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 not a popular thing for me to say especially if you want to go to medical school but students go through our program and they might not get a pluses and everything and they still get um, they still get like into great great programs regardless of their grades because they know that they're from Stanford by engineering all right so um yeah yeah i yeah I, it, it 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 is quite cool for me to see that our students get into really really awesome programs um you know um see you alice uh, but you know what you should do i tell you what you should do sophia you should uh you should sign up for bye 44 right and then um, then you won't get into the course because uh you're probably not declared as a bioengineering major, but then you just email me and you say, hey, I was part of the bio hackathon, whatever, uh, the idea-a-thon, which was now the imagine-a-thon. And then you tell them, just remind me that we had this conversation. And then uh, if we just keep this conversation private, I can get you into the course, okay? So I can make sure you get into the course. And I think that course is applicable to Hume Bio. So if you want to switch back, you can actually apply those that course to your Hume Bio lab or whatever. Um, but I say take Bio 44, sign up for it whenever. It, we teach it twice a year and and just go from there. Talk to other students and see, talk, talk, you know, ask, their, ask them about their experience. Sign up for okay. Bio 44. I will do that. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Actually, I have, I have uh, yeah, it's uh, Bio 44 is becoming more popular among human bio students. Like I have a lot of them who signed up recently um, and they're digging the course because they know it's sort of basic, really. It's it's basic biology, to be, to be honest. Um, and we review all the biology and everything. And then we, we will train you. We will teach you how to engineer cells. We will teach you how to, you know, design a plasmid. And you won't feel like an expert, you know, <laughs> You know, which is so oftentimes students don't feel like they're like an expert, you know, but I still don't feel like an expert in biology and I've done it for years, you know, so yeah. 
I had a friend who was in home bio. He was a junior and he took bio E44 and that's what made him, he couldn't change his major full on because he was a junior, but uh, he's now focusing his like, you, you do a specialty when you do home bio, right? And so he, he's doing a custom one in bio E to take as many bio E classes as he can <laughs> before he graduates. Nice. That's Josh. <laughs> oh, cool. Nice. Also, uh, I would say that bioengineering has a really amazing resources in terms of people. So I have like large teaching teams, you know, for bio 103, we have like four TAs and then additional, all the help we can to help students. And then we're also like three total faculty with four TAs. That's like a, a big teaching team. And we, we try and make sure that you have all the help that you can get, right? Um, other other classes, maybe you have like large classes and one person is trying to do everything and they just can't, you know, they can't provide the support to all students because their department don't actually have the resources to maybe take care of students. Um, and that is true. And in Stanford is fine. You know what I mean? Like whatever, whatever you're going to choose at Stanford, you're going to be fine. Um, but I would say that we have amazing resources and something to consider. Another little thing that I'm not, that I want to mention, not to throw a Zelda in front of a train, but uh, to do that, Zelda was super helpful um, when I did the biohackathon my sophomore year, uh, brainstorming with a project. Um, as we can say, as I died, Zelda is some of my favorite of the BioE faculty and staff. Um, but <laughs> uh, all of them are super accessible. You're free, I'm sure, to email Zelda for help. There's also Ross, um, Ross's um, Vinook is also in the bio department, specializes in like uh, electrical engineering things and kind of like actual like build design. Um, super helpful too. Like any, just look up like any, almost any professor or lecturer in the bio -E department, shoot them an email and be like, hey, I'm like, working on this project for the bio and bio hackathon and they're going to be like oh cool like here's some ideas how can i help you let me i'll post my email for you in chat in case you want that um because i'm i'm in the process of legally changing my name which is why there's might be a bit confusion about that um but this is my email address you can just email me and just just remind me that we interacted in this platform and i will help you out okay great thank you so much no problem yeah i i guess I don't know. I I am a little bit scared by the requirements, but I'm like really heavily considering it after like after doing this hackathon. So or not hackathon, ideathon. You know, you if this ha if this ideathon converts even just one person to bio e, like a hundred percent worth. <laughs> <laughs> Guess it's job nature. security for me, so I'm I'm recruiting people now to buy engineering. So. Well, it's good to be here. Um, I don't know. Do, do you guys still want to chat? Should we stop the recording? Yeah, I was going to okay. say.